Okay, now it's really time to start. I'm very happy to uh, have here uh, Tobias Müller, who uh, has agreed to come here and to give a talk uh, on our favorite subject on random graphs uh, and even on zero one rules for random graphs, probably. So uh, the name of this talk, the title is Logic and Random Graphs from Minor Closed Plus. Okay, so All right, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, coming to my talk, and thank you very much, uh, Andre, uh, for the invitation to uh, come here. I really appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, what I'm going to talk about is uh, joint work with um, Peter Heinrich and Anush Taras, who are from in Hamburg, and Mark Noy, who is in uh, Barcelona, in Spain. <coughs> so, oh, turn it on. Uh, so what we're talking about are, um, well, graphs. So I guess we can assume that everybody knows what a graph is. Uh, and in particular, so we're interested in uh, properties of graphs, right? So property like um, being connected or uh, having a triangle, this kind of thing. Uh, but now I'm going to restrict attention to properties which can be expressed by a certain kind of formula, right? So it's a mathematical formula. Uh, where uh, you can use the standard uh, well-known quantifiers for, the, for all and there exists. And you can have uh, variables in your formula that um, range over the, the vertices, the points of your graph. And then you can have the usual logical symbols, right? So and, or, not, etc. And you can also uh, put two different relations between the variables in your formula. You can say x equals y, or you can say x twiddle y. Here, this, I usually pronounce this as twiddle. So this means that there is a, an edge between the x and y. <coughs> right, so we have this language. It's called the first order language of graphs uh, from uh, logic. And uh, yeah, so we let f all denote all the properties that we can express with such a formula. So, of course, it's all very abstract, so maybe it's good to have a few examples. So, first of all, one property that um, you could, for instance, express in this way is uh, there, exi there exists no triangle in the graph, right? So I say there do not exist three, uh, three uh, points, u, v, w, such that all the three Pair, possible pairs have an edge between each other, right? So that is saying, so now I'm saying that there cannot be a triangle in the graph. Right, so is everybody okay with this so far? Right, so there are some, so some things you can just write a formula in this language. Also, I can first say, so making it slightly more complicated and maybe also a slightly uh, more esoteric property, right? I can say that if there are two points that contain, uh, are uh, contained in an edge, then there is a third point that is connected to both of them. So every edge that you can find is contained in a triangle. Um, and that, that I can write in this way. Yes, of course, that's maybe a strange property, but people in uh, random graphs sometimes uh, actually study this kind of property. And uh, also it's important to note that, okay, so I have these logical this logical language, uh, but actually, um, you know, we do not claim that every everything you can ask about a graph can be expressed in this language. And in particular, you can show that uh, being connected is not expressible in this language. So you cannot write a formula that is true for every graph that is connected and it's false for every graph that is not connected. And so you can, you can actually prove that. And uh, maybe later on, I'll give you a hint. For that also, like, you cannot prove that the graph can be colored with uh, two colors. Even just say that the graph is bipartite, you cannot express this in uh, such a formula or that it's four colorable or for any, for any number, you cannot write that as a formula in this way. And uh, also containing a Hamilton cycle. So maybe I should have asked this. So does everybody know what, the, uh, what it means to color a graph with uh, two colors? Yeah? Or uh, what it is to be contain a Hamilton cycle? Who knows what the Hamilton cycle is? Who doesn't know what the Hamilton cycle is? Everybody knows. Okay. 
Yeah, so there's, an, yeah, so inverse also like having an even number of vertices, I cannot express this with a, with a, with a formula, right? So the point being that there need to be a formula that is really true for all the graphs that don't contain this, have this property, and it's false for all the ones that don't have it. And the formula, so it has to be a fixed formula with a fixed number of variables, let's say, right? Um, all right. Um, and so there's another, so one way to uh, fix the situation is say, okay, let's uh, try to make the language a little bit stronger. Um, and so for instance, what you can do is, so we allow uh, more types of variables. We can say, we will allow variables that now they don't range over single points, but they range over sets of, the, of points, right? So here I have, I use big letters for the set variables. So I'm going to extend the language. I'm going to have more types of variables. And uh, I have these set variables, but um, now um, what we do, so you can do all the stuff that you had before, like and or not, et cetera. You, for, the, for the point variables like x, little x, and little y, you can ask, are they equal or do they have an edge? But I don't want to allow you to uh, ask whether two sets are equal, so not whether big x is equal to big y. For some, uh, for some reason, so for the big variables, we only allow you to ask, is a certain variable inside the set or not? Yeah, so we get the, a family of properties. So it may be still a bit uh, abstract we have. But so you have a family of uh, properties of grass that we can express in this uh, more slightly stronger language called monadic second order language. And uh, so for example, what you can do now, remember that I said just a moment ago that in this first order language, we cannot ask whether the graph is connected. But now in the monadic second order, we can actually do this. So we can say, okay, so for every set of vertices, it is either the case that it's the, uh, all of the vertices or it's the empty set, or it is the case that there exists some point in the set of vertices and some point or in a set of vertices outside, and they're connected by an edge, yeah? So if a graph, so you can work out that if a graph has this property, right? So for every subset of the vertices, you know, either it's a complete set or the empty set, or there's some edge between it and its complement, this is exactly saying that the graph is connected, All right? So, uh, so here we have expressed uh, being connected, which we could not in first order. And uh, you can similarly, for every fixed k, I can write that the graph is k colorable. Uh, and now I, I didn't want to bother writing down the, uh, the formula completely uh, for, uh, formally because it would be kind of a big formula already. But so if I, I can say there exist sets x1 to xk such that every point is in exactly one of these sets and there's no edge between points of the same set, right? So the, the sets, X1 is just everyone that's colored in color one, X2 is everyone that's in color two, etc. And so you can sort of see that, hopefully you can sort of uh, see, or at least believe me that, yeah, you can write this down in a, in a, in a neat formula with all these symbols, it just be uh, a little bit uh, longer than the previous one. Yeah, so we have these two uh, logical languages, of course, there, there are more, right? So you can have uh, bigger languages, but these are the two that I'm gonna be considering in the talk. And again, it's important for these MSO that, uh, right, so there's some, exa some examples of properties that cannot be expressed in MSO, and in particular, uh, containing a Hamilton cycle, you can prove that you cannot express this in, the, in this MSO language. Yeah, so there, yeah. so, and again, that's not uh, super easy to prove. Uh, okay. So next, so um, one um, very nice, very attractive result in the theory of uh, random graphs, I guess uh, very much in the beginning, that was done by actually four um, Russian people. Uh, and then a lot later, independently by an American called Ron Fagan, says the following. So suppose that we take um, all the graphs on n vertices, and we pick one uniformly at random, right? So there are like, uh, um, we take, uh, so, oops, it's still wet. 
right? We have uh, vertices one, two, up to n, right? And then uh, I consider all the possible ways of making a graph on the uh, on these n vertices, and I pick one of these uniformly at random, so they have all the same probability. Um, and uh, so it's not difficult to see that uh, the number of uh, graphs is uh, this number, right? It's 2 to the power n choose 2, because for every possible connection, there are two possibilities. Either the edge is there or not, right? So there are this many, uh, this many possible outcomes, and I pick each one with the equal probability, 1 over 2 to the power n choose 2, yeah? And then we can uh, pick our favorite formula expressed in this uh, first order logic of graphs, and we can say, so if we take a random graph like this, what's the probability that this formula is true, right? And now, of course, that's going to depend on the particular formula, and it's going to, going to depend on the number n, right? So in general, I cannot say very much about it, or maybe I could maybe give a very precise answer, but that would be very difficult. Uh, but what you can uh, show is this very nice result. So if you consider what happens if the number of points of the, that we are building this graph on, if this goes to infinity, then in fact, um, whatever formula you took, the probability that it, uh, the graph has the property will either be tending to 1 or to 0. So the graph is almost either very likely to have this property or very unlikely to have the property. Right? And so this notation here, I don't know if you're familiar with it. I took it from a logic, right? So it just means that the graph satisfies the property, right? So phi is some formula which denotes a property. So it's just saying gn is, uh, satisfies this particular property. And so what they showed is that um, you, you always get either 0 or 1 in the, in the limits. Either uh, almost all graphs somehow satisfy this property or almost none. Uh, and yeah, so, and of course, so what did you mention? So the reason why this got published again, su such a blatant uh, seven years later, and that uh, people still also, you know, say that it's independent work is because this was before, uh, you know, before Iron Curtain uh, fell, which maybe some of you have still, were still already, still already alive at that time. But anyway, it was a time when there was a very little communication between the East and the West and, people could just do uh, work, uh, couldn't be aware of the work in, uh, on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, in fact, so, so, so you might wonder about this, right? So I just introduced this monadic second order logic. So much later, um, Kaufman and uh, Saron Schlag proved that in fact, if I wanted to put here MSO, then this theorem would actually fail. Right, so it wouldn't be true if I allowed a bigger set of properties, then in fact this li these limits wouldn't always be in zero one. In fact, they show that uh, the limit doesn't even have to exist. So you can write down formulas where with this very simple way of picking a graph at random, the property will not converge. It will somehow do some strange uh, non convert you know, the oscillating behavior. <coughs> All right, uh, yeah, no, that's what I just said. So, uh, um, yeah. Let me, so, since I, I have a bit more time than I thought, so I'll just add, uh, than I thought when I was preparing this uh, talk. So let me just um, extend this. Uh, add a little bit of uh, more detail about this particular result. So what I'm going to present you now is, uh, well, sort of my version of the proof of this result, or my version of Fagan's proof of this result. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the Russian authors wrote because, uh, well, I don't cannot read Russian. Uh, but anyway, so that what is really nice about, uh, really attractive about this area of uh, research, or at least what I find very nice, is that uh, at uh, many points you can actually kind of forget all about logic and everything, and you can switch to playing games, right? Which is something that some of you like, maybe. 
So uh, what the proof does is we analyze a certain kind of game that is played on graphs. On, so you take two graphs and there will be two players that will play this game. And in this case, it will be, well, I say here, the Erdős Rényi random graph. But that's, that's basically this, this thing here, right? So we take a random graph. Um, so yeah, what I could say also, another way to pick a graph uniformly at random from all graphs or n vertices is to say that for each possible connection, I flip a fair coin with probability one half, I put it, and with probability one half, I don't put this connection. And I just repeat this for all the things, and then everyone gets probability one over two to the inches two, right? So it's the same. And the, so, the, so that's the Ernest Rennie model of random grass is just that, that for every edge you flip a coin to decide whether there's, a, whether there's an edge or not, yeah? So in this case, we're just gonna, what we're gonna be playing is this game, and typically you might, uh, or in this proof, we might take two, two copies of the same, um, <clears throat> two, two, uh, two random graphs, yeah? And so the point of the proof will be to show, uh, in fact, one of these two players has a winner strategy, so there will be two players, uh, but the role, they don't exactly play, they don't have the same roles, right? So, uh, yeah, I guess in more, most board games, the players have kind of similar objectives, but here the players will have slightly different objectives. So we'll, we'll get to it later. So what we'll show is that um, with very high probability, if you pick two random graphs, actually one of the two players will be able to win the, win the game. So there's a, like 99% chance that actually uh, the player with the red color can win this game always. Yeah, uh, that's kind of the idea of the proof. So a bit more detail. So uh, what is this game that I'm talking about? So it's called the Ernvoigt or Ernvoigt Fresse game. So we have these two graphs, right, G and H, and we have these two players called uh, Spoiler and Duplicator. Um, and the reason is that, so spoiler, his goal is just to spoil the win of duplicator. And duplicator, uh, what he tries to do will be come clear in a minute. So what we do is, so the game is played over a fixed number of rounds. So uh, for instance, 10, right? We say before the game starts, we say we will play for 10 rounds, yeah? And then uh, in each round, the round starts with the spoiler. So there are two graphs, right? So here's G, whatever, and uh, here's uh, H. Yeah, they don't have to have the same vertices. So in uh, some round, a spoiler can pick one of these two graphs and he puts, uh, so if it's a round I, he puts a number I on some vertex. Yeah, and then duplicator has to go to the other side and he has to put I on the on a uh, on a vertex of the other graph, and now spoiler can choose again, right? So he can uh, put I plus one somewhere, but he can choose maybe to put it here, right? He can put it. He doesn't have to always play on the same graph. So he can choose where he plays, and now duplicator has to go here, and he has to put I plus one on a vertex of the other graph. Yeah, and so we keep playing until our fixed number. So let's say ten is reached. Yeah. Yeah, so I hope that every, everything's clear so far. Or, uh, we're all happy with that, yeah? So that's how the game plays. And then at the end, so how do we decide uh, who has won? So the point is, so how, how, do, we, how do we decide who, who has won? So we consider a map, right, where we send the vertex that is labeled I in the one graph, so we send it to the label I vertex in the other graph, and the one labeled i plus one has to go to the one labeled i plus one in the other graph, yeah? And if this map is such that there is an edge here, that if there's an edge here between i and i plus one, there's an edge here between i and i plus one, right? Or between i and j, right? So if I have a j here and a j here, yeah? And uh, so if there's an edge between i and j, there also has to be an edge between i and j here. Otherwise, uh, so if, if this happened, that there's an edge between i and j, if, and if there's an edge between i and j on the other side, then um, duplicator has won. And otherwise, uh, duplicator has lost, and then spoiler has won. Yeah, and also what I should say, so of course it's possible, for instance, that um, there's like i plus two 
and I are both attached to the same graph, right? Then I also want that, uh, I also demand that um, they are labeled on the same vertex in the other graph. This is also an, a demand for duplicated to win. All right, so, uh, yeah, right, so yeah, that's what I just said. So duplicator won the game if whenever there's an edge between two vertices in one graph, there's an edge between two vertices in the other graph and similarly here. So an example, right, so to make it a bit more clear, right, so here are two graphs, G and H. Spoiler starts, so if uh, spoiler is smart, he will start by labeling this vertex, yeah? And now duplicator has to play on this graph G, so maybe he plays here. And now I'm duplicator and, uh, sorry, now I'm spoiler, I go, I switch, right? So it's kind of uh, useful to switch. So I go to this graph and I label two, yeah? And now we see that spoiler has in fact won the game, right? In only two moves because uh, duplicator has to put a, a two here, but two here is connected to one and here it's not possible to do that, right? So. It's, uh, it's very useful to switch and uh, that can uh, help you win the game. So that's uh, one example of uh, how you could play this game. All right, so is, this is, is this clear how the game uh, works? All right, so uh, obviously the natural question is what does this game have to do with uh, logic, right? It's of course uh, fun to try and play this with your sister, but uh, anyway, yeah, so the reason why we introduce this game is because you can show that in fact for every formula that we can write in this first order logic of graphs, uh, well, there's some number k such that if uh, this formula is true on a particular graph and false on another graph, then a spoiler must be able to win the k round Ehrenfurcht game played on these two games. Yeah, so um, I'm not going to do the proof. It's not super difficult, actually, but uh, don't, I'm not going to do it. And if you, if you want it, I think you can, I think you might be able to find it. There's a book by Alon and Spencer, uh, The Probabilistic Method. I think it contains the proof. I'm not 100% sure. And, and perhaps uh, many of you are already familiar with that, with that book as uh, kind of a standard uh, text in probabilistic and extreme combinatorics. Yeah, but so you can, so you can, you can kind of show that, um, yeah, it's, it's not very hard to prove this. And in fact, you can kind of even find the strategy for spoiler by looking at the formula if you're clever. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So then um, here's um, a quote from a song. Uh, I'm not gonna sing for you. Uh, but anyway, so it's about some, I, um, this song is older than me, but uh, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't necessarily like it very much, but um, Peter Winkler does like it. And so he kind of used this uh, song as an inspiration for defining a particular uh, property of graph, or at least for naming it, um, which is called the, so the Alice's Restaurant property, right? So in the, in the song, somehow, it says that in this restaurant, you can get whatever you want, whatever recipe you want. So the Alice's Restaurant property, if you are uh, playing the Erfurt game on uh, two graphs, then uh, getting whatever you want could be something like this. So, uh, well, we have some number K, right, which might be 10, whatever. Um, so uh, the Alice's restaurant property with, pro uh, with parameter k holds if whenever uh, you give me two sets a and b which have size at most k and they're disjoint, then there is some vertex which will be adjacent to everyone in a and not uh, nobody in b, right? So if I have some uh, graph which I denote here by this potato, right? And if I have some A and B, then there must be some vertex V that is adjacent to all of these guys and not adjacent to any of these guys. 
So that's what Alice's restaurant property would be, right? So, um, right, so obviously k will be uh, typically much smaller than the order of the graph. Yeah. So, but this is a useful property to have. Um, and uh, basically, uh, why it's very useful is because of this lemma. So, if two graphs both contain this Alice's restaurant property, then I claim the duplicator can win the game. Yeah, and the proof uh, in my slide it's only uh, one line. The reason, uh, well, so that is, so I have here this G, right? And I have here an H, yeah? And suppose that at some uh, point I, uh, right, so we have, so we're at some move I, and uh, there are some vertices, already some guys, one up to I minus one have been labeled, right? And then I pick a node I, yeah? So it will be adjacent to maybe one, maybe not two, maybe three, right, and some other guys, yeah? Uh, so let's say that the uh, so support is played here, yeah? And um, then uh, here I have one, two, three, until i minus one. So what does uh, duplicator do? He says, well, so a is like the, the points one, three, and uh, i minus one, let's say, and b is uh, the points two, uh, four, i minus two, yeah? And then he can find some vertex that is exactly adjacent to these guys and not to the other guys, and he just labels this with i. Yeah, so that's why, so if you have this property, for a given k, then duplicator can always uh, win the game by just saying that my a is the ones that I should be connected to and my b is the ones I shouldn't be connected to to survive, to not make a mistake in this round. Yeah? All right, so is everybody still uh, following me? All right. Okay, so that's uh, so. Um, Right, if you're will willing to believe this thing about the, that the Ehrenberg game somehow uh, gives a criterion for the, these logical formulas, then uh, all we need to do is that for every fixed k, right, this random graph, which I denoted here like this, right, so the this Rennie random graph with parameter a half, yeah, but it, which just means that with probability one half, we add each of these uh, connections, has this LSS restaurant property with probability that will tend to one is n goes to infinity, right? So little r1 means just something that goes to zero. And the proof is uh, really a very easy computation, right? So what's the probability that this Ellis restaurant property fails? <coughs> I don't know exactly what it is, uh, but I can, uh, I can give an upper bound, right? So what has to happen? So I, pick a, uh, I have to pick a set, of si a set A, which uh, has some size less than K, right, so I, I'm going to sum over all ways of picking a set of si uh, set A and a set B, right, so uh, both of these have size at most K, so I first I pick a size, uh, sizes I and J, then I pick a set of size I to be the, take the role of A, right, so that's N choose I ways, then I have to pick a, si a set of size J from the remaining points, yeah, and now what should be the case is that for all the remaining vertices, right, so for all the remaining vertices, um, it has to be the case that the vertex, that uh, the vertex does not have the property that it is connected to everyone in A and nobody in B, yeah? So the probability that a given vertex has all these connections and none of these connections, yeah, it's just uh, one half to the power of the number of connections that I want to fix, right? Because each of these connections had probability one half, yeah? So the probability that uh, this vertex is actually okay to play the role uh, for A and B is this one, right? Um, but I want, so if I want this to fail for um, all vertices, so if it, it fails for a certain vertex for this probability, one minus this, and I want it to fail for all the, all the vertices not in A and B, so that means that I have to take it to this power because if I take another vertex here, it has some edges going there and there, 
And these edges are uh, disjoint, right? So the, the probability that this one is bad for A and B and the probability that this one is bad for A and B, they're like independent, right? Because the, the edges involved, they, they uh, are different. Yeah, the, so if you, do you know that this didn't work? That doesn't tell you anything whether this will, will not work. Yeah, so uh, I just get, uh, get this sum as an upper bound for the probability that we don't have the Alice's Restaurant property, right? So it's this, uh, all the ways of picking a set A, picking a set B, and then all the remaining vertices not being uh, as we would like, yeah? And then, uh, well, I didn't do this computation now, but you can very easily work out that this is actually going to go to zero quite fast, right? So the point is that if k is fixed, then a half to the power i plus j, uh, it is not going to zero. It's going to be some constant, right? So this term here is actually exponentially small, yeah? And these terms are at most like n to the k or something. So you can easily see that this will, will go to zero quite fast. Yeah, so the probability that it fails will go to zero. So therefore, the probability that it doesn't fail will go to one. Yeah, so uh, Alice's restaurant property holds with very high probability in uh, this random graph model. So just to uh, give an overview, so basically now we proved already the, uh, the result of uh, uh, Glebsky uh, et al. and Fagin. All right, so what you can say, so pick, uh, so we pick some formula. But well, then the lemma about this game said there's some k for the number of moves for, uh, that uh, you have to play the game for to find out whether two graphs will satisfy this, uh, will differ on the truth value of this formula. So we take the corresponding k. Then we can say, well, fix some graph that satisfies this uh, Alice's restaurant. Uh, we know that such a graph exists because Erdos Renyi random graphs satisfy them for large enough n, yeah? Then we say, um, so let's assume that phi is true in H, yeah? Then we can play the K round game on the erdos Rennie random graph and on H. And um, if the erdos Rennie random graph, the probability that the erdos Rennie random graph satisfies uh, the formula is at least the probability that we satisfy the Ellis's restaurant property. Why is this? Because if we satisfy the Ellis's restaurant property, then duplicator wins the, uh, the Ehrenfeucht game. And that means that phi is, um, has to be both true on H and on uh, the erdos Rennie random graph at the same time by the lemma about the, about the game. Yeah? So um, if this holds, then certainly you must satisfy the phi. Yeah, but this had probability going to one. And the case when uh, phi is not true in H is basically the same. So you can, uh, yeah, it just follows by uh, symmetry. You can just put here uh, not phi and have the same uh, argument. Yeah, so this is essentially, this is the entire, uh, this is basically the, the proof model of this one lemma about the, um, about the game. All right, so um, any questions about this? Or, no? All right, so then I'm going to go back to ooh, the other one. No, I'll keep doing this one. Yeah, so, um, Right, so what we have just seen is uh, what we call, is an example of what we call a zero-one law, right? So we take uh, some sequence of random graphs, right? In this case, it was uh, pretty much the simplest possible kind of way to make a random graph. But in general, you can imagine that I have some way to, of generating bigger and bigger random graphs. And then I uh, take, um, uh, I say that I satisfy the zero-one law if the probability that I satisfy a formula will always go to zero, one, no matter what the formula, right? And that where the formulas will range over either the set of all possible first order formulas 
or the set of all possible MSO formulas or whatever you like really. But so here we have the, so what we proved before is that there's a zero one law for first order logic in the erdos rennie random graph. Yeah, and uh, what could also happen, so it's possible that um, this is not true, but it could be that um, still we have that all these limits exist, right? So that for every formula that you take, uh, maybe the limit is not going to be either zero or one, uh, but it could be uh, at least the limits could exist for, for all possible formulas. So then we say that the uh, convergence law exists. Uh, and of course, so kind of uh, a silly remark maybe. Um, of course, this range zero and one can never be reduced to only one of the two values, right? Because if there's some formula for which the limit is one, then if I put negation in front of that formula, right? So if the probability that there's a triangle goes to one, then the probability that there is no triangle goes to zero, right? So this is kind of the smallest possible range that we could have, right? But um, in general, yeah, you could uh, have convergence to some other set of uh, values that are not just zero and one. All right, so the ernst rennie model, well, I kind of said that already, right? So in general, we allow a probability P of there being a connection, right? Not just one half, could be anything. And uh, what's interesting or funny to mention is that uh, it's often called the ernst rennie model. Um, but in fact, the first person to actually define this, uh, this model was uh, someone else called Ian Gilbert. Um, who also did uh, a lot of interesting stuff in uh, random graph theory and percolation. But anyway, yeah, so uh, Erdos and Rennie actually published su uh, earlier on random graphs, but they had a slightly different uh, model called the GNM model. <clears throat> so one thing that is very natural to ask, I just, uh, we had all this story about what happens when P equals one half, right? So what would happen if P uh, took on a different value, right? So what if P was, let's say, one third, right? And it, so it turns out, well, so let's, it turns out actually that, um, well, if you take P equals to one third, then actually the whole proof that I had before will basically uh, work and you still get the zero one law. Um, also, if P is going to zero, but not very fast, you can kind of save it in uh, many cases. Um, but however, you know, you can also wonder, so what if, uh, we take more and more vertices and we send P, let's say, to zero. Uh, and so one really surprising result, I think, or and very attractive also, is uh, the following. So uh, this is by Spencer and, uh, by Shalach and Spencer from 88. So they said, well, suppose that we take, uh, so we have N vertices and uh, we let P somehow decrease with N as, uh, as N grows larger and larger in uh, some very specific way. So like P equal to uh, some negative power of uh, N, right? So N is, let's say, one over root N, right? Or one over, uh, sorry, yeah, one over root N or one over N to the minus pi, uh, minus pi or whatever, something like this. So what they showed is that this zero one law holds if and only if this number here, this, this uh, power is not a rational number. Right, which is kind of pretty surprising, I think, because somehow, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to think of what could be different if I take the number, uh, let's say, root two or some number that is very close to root two, it has some decimals different, like what could possibly be so different there? But it turns out that, uh, so yes, if the number is irrational, then whatever formula you pick, the probability will always be either zero or one. But if you take a non uh, a rational number, then you can find formulas, which in fact um, they don't uh, they don't not only converge either to zero or one the probability, but in fact the formula uh, the probability will uh, not converge at all. So they had this really amazing uh, example of formulas there with a complicated proof to show that actually there are formulas which don't even converge. If, if alpha is irrational, uh, sorry, if alpha is rational.
All right. Um, but anyway, so that wasn't really what I uh, was going to talk about at all, right? So I didn't talk about uh, my own work at all so far. So what I want to talk about um, for the rest of the talk is um, graphs from minor closed classes. So what's a minor? So minors are a really big, uh, important subject in uh, modern graph theory. Um, what's a minor of a graph? So it's anything. So one graph is a minor of another graph if you can um, obtain it by these three operations. So you can remove vertices, you can remove edges, and you can also contract edges, which just means that if I have two points connected by an edge, then I somehow imagine shrinking this edge, you know, I'm, I'm sucking these two points into each other, and I keep all the other connections there. Yeah, so here's an example. So I have this graph here, so I can say I remove this edge, then I remove this vertex, and then I shrink this edge, I got a triangle, right? So the triangle is a minor of this graph, right? Even though this graph doesn't have any triangle, the uh, triangle is a minor because I can somehow, in some kind of way, deform it into a, into a triangle. So that's what a minor is. And, uh, well, it has a very, uh, fairly long history, right? Going back basically to uh, characterizing planarity by uh, Kortowski and Wagner in the 30s. Um, so we say that a graph is, or a collection of graphs is minor closed. If the obvious thing is true, if uh, whenever you take a minor of some group of, uh, of some graph in a class, it's also in a class. So an example is uh, forests, right, which is a collection of trees. So you can kind of uh, convince yourself that if I take any, any forest and I, uh, whatever I can do by create, doing these operations, I will be stuck with a forest, right? So if I remove an edge or if I remove a vertex, I still have a forest. Or if I shrink an edge, it's still a forest, yeah? Um, another thing is if you fix any surface, right? So here I took, uh, or I didn't make this picture, but here we have a torus, right? And so I tried to draw a graph on this torus in such a way that no edges cross, right? Then you can actually convince yourself that these operations of removing edges, removing vertices, and shrinking the edges, uh, they don't destroy really the drawing. So you can kind of adapt the drawing so that you still have a drawing on the, on the surface. This works for every uh, drawing, right? And that's, I guess that's why people came up with these minors because, uh, you know, looking at planar graphs. So planar graphs are one of the most important examples of a minor closed class of graphs. Um, yeah, and in particular, so uh, I can also do the following. So I can say I'll take um, a number of graphs and then I'll say, okay, X, G1 of the GK is the set of all graphs that don't contain any of these as a minor, right? So for instance, uh, if I say take a single vertex, a single graph, I take the triangle. So what's a collection of all graphs that don't have a triangle as a minor? So it's it's not very difficult to convince yourself that in fact this is forced. Yeah, because uh, so forced, whatever I do, I won't ever get uh, a triangle. And uh, whenever I have a cycle somewhere, I can make a triangle because I, I throw away everything else and then I shrink the cycle into a triangle. So uh, forest is exactly the set of graphs that are characterized by not having a triangle as an excluded minor, yeah? And then there's this famous uh, classical result by Wagner from the 30s that so planar graphs is exactly the graphs that don't have either a K5 or a K33 as a minor. So, I mean, does it, who doesn't know what the K5 and K33 are? Everybody is happy with that, right? So you all, I, I don't want to, right? So that's a very nice result. And uh, then there is a really cool uh, result, of course, uh, super complicated. So uh, the pro uh, projective plane, right? It's, a, it's another surface, two-dimensional surface that you might be familiar with, right? You can get it by uh, identifying antipodes on the sphere. Um, and so Archdeacon, in his thesis, he actually gave an explicit characterization. So he, he gave a list of 35 graphs and like, if a graph does not have, 
a graph can be drawn on a projective plane without crossings if and only if it doesn't have a minor uh, isomorphic to one of these 35 uh, uh, guys in the list. And uh, um, yeah, um, right. And then there's another really important uh, work in graph theory, right? The graph minor theorem, which basically says that whenever I have a group of graphs that is close to undertaking minors, right? So meaning that whenever there's a, I take a minor of some guys in the in this class, it will be there. Then, in fact, there's always a finite list of uh, excluded minors. Yeah, and then, so that's a like, super technical. And an, inter an interesting uh, side remark, I think, is that so we have here, uh, right? We have the the, the plane, right, uh, or the sphere, and then we have the projective plane. And basically, for all other uh, all other services, we don't have this explicit list of uh, forbidden um, minors, right? So uh, anyway, you might wonder about that. So that's a kind of cool uh, thing to look at, but I guess uh, super hard if you want to try this for whatever the tour is or something like that. Anyway, so uh, I have to give a few more definitions. So we'll say that the graph class is addable if the following holds. So, um, so graph class, by the way, just uh, a word for a group of gla uh, graphs that is closed under isomorphism so that uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, so if I have the triangle, um, right? I have the, the triangle can be represented by uh, on the vertices one to three, but it can also be A, B, C, right? And so if one to three is in there, then also the triangle A, B, C is in there, right? So a graph justice means that it's a collection of graphs that is closed under isomorphism which just means that I cannot change the names of the labels and, and get a, a graph that's in a class. So addable means that, okay, so if I have a graph with multiple components, each of the components is also in the graph class. And uh, if I have uh, a graph that has more than one component, so for instance, let's say I have this graph here, then, uh, if there's some edge that goes between two different components, then if I add this edge, then this new graph is still in the, in the graph class, right? So that's where the word addable comes from, right? So I can add all these edges between different components. And so examples, again, so fourths are addable. Planar graphs are addable, right? Because in a planar graph, it's easy that you can do this. But for instance, uh, if I take the torus, graphs that can be drawn on the torus, they are not addable, right? Because um, at some point um, you can make, um, so for instance, uh, yeah, I could, I could draw like, a, I could have lots of um, components on uh, the torus and then by just drawing them up somehow later, I get something that, has uh, a large clique minor or something like that. So I guess, yeah, I guess you'd have to play with that a bit, but you can show in fact that having a crossing free drawing on a surface S for any surface other than uh, the sphere or the plane, in fact, it's not an addable class of graphs. For instance, if I take the torus, <laughs> right? And here's, yes, yeah, so there's another thing. So if you uh, like doing graph minor theory and you already bored my talk, then you can try to show this, that a minor closed cl class is addable if and only if every forbidden minor is two connected. Anyway, that's just a random addition. Um, so I need, uh, again, some more uh, notation. So um, G sub N will be, if I, I fix some graph class, and G sub N will be all the graphs that are um, that have N vertices that have the labels, the names one up to N. Then a GN is the number of such graphs, right? So um, here there were two to the N choose two different graphs, but if I say take say let's say planar graphs, right? So uh, GN is the number of planar graphs on on N vertices, right? And that's obviously going to be some other number. 
Um, then there's something called the exponential generating function, right? So I'd say <coughs> this uh, power series uh, in Z where the coefficients are gn over n factorial. That's, you, uh, that's a important uh, quantity. Um, and rho will be the radius of convergence of this thing. And then uh, I'm going to be taking, uh, so because in the end we're interested in random graphs, right? so we're going to take, uh, so fix some graph class, and then we're going to randomly pick a graph from that graph class, uh, from, the, from all the graphs on n vertices on that graph class. So we take one uniformly at random from all possible graphs. So for instance, we take uh, a random planar graph on n vertices. And then also sometimes we want to restrict ourselves to picking a graph uniformly at random, but restricting to only connected graphs, right? So only take uh, graphs that are connected. And uh, so some um, important background information. So for forest, you can actually kind of work out what this function here is. And uh, it turns out that the radius of convergence is 1 over e. And if I plug in the radius of convergence into this power series, then the power series uh, is still convergent. And the number that you get out turns out to be root of e. So that's kind of standard. Uh, I think you can find it in textbooks on uh, enumeration. Then something much, much harder was like this uh, really uh, yeah, amazing, amazing piece of work by uh, Mark Noy, who is one of my co-authors, and uh, Omer Gimenez, that, uh, who was uh, one of his students at the time. So they actually worked out explicitly what is the radius of convergence for the class of uh, planar graphs, and also that you can plug it into this, this thing here and you get a number out. So in fact, they, they kind of uh, give like an explicit kind of uh, equation that, that gives the, whose root is the, is the, the number that you have to solve. And you can approximate it to any degree of accuracy that you want using MAPO or whatever. <clears throat> so uh, in the work that uh, I'm kind of uh, presenting here, which is together with uh, these two Germans right, and uh, Mark Noy that I just mentioned. Um, so what we showed is that, so if I take an addable class of graphs, for instance, uh, the class of all um, planar graphs, right, or all forests. And I take a random connected graph from this class, right, so I take a random connected planar graph. Then, in fact, it, can, it uh, satisfies the monadic second order 0, 1 law. Right? So the 0, 1 law holds not only for first order, but even for this more general uh, set of formulas that we had. Um, and the reason why we took connected graphs here and not just all graphs is because, uh, in fact, this theorem wouldn't hold for the set of all planar graphs. So, in fact, uh, you can show that it doesn't hold, but you can still prove the convergence law. So, if I take a random planar graph on n vertices, then uh, for every MSO formula, the probability that it holds will converge to some number. Um, which is not necessarily zero one. So the reason why this, uh, the zero one law fails, for instance, for this guy is that for a random planar graph, there's a constant probability that there is an isolated vertex, for instance. So there's a, if I take um, a random planar graph, a random graph uniformly at random from all graphs that can be drawn in the plane on n vertices, then a certain fraction of them will have an isolated vertex. In, <laughs> That's not uh, super difficult to show. All right. Okay, and um, another thing that we were able to show is that, so if we take, uh, instead of the plane, we take another, we fix some other surface, like the torus, uh, then in fact you can still show that the uh, connected graphs from this class, they don't, uh, now, um, they satisfy this first order zero one law, but no longer we can no longer show the MSO zero one law, and um, also the value of these limits don't depend on the choice of the surface. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of the, so whatever logical formula you take, um, there's a zero one law, but somehow 
uh, it doesn't matter whether you had the torus or the or the or the plane or whatever. All the all the formulas have the same limit. So somehow also this gives some indication that you cannot really capture the the surface in terms of the logic. Right. <coughs> um, yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah, and similarly, right, so also if we take, uh, so we take connected, we get 0, 1, and if we take uh, all possible graphs, we get the convergence law. And um, so the proofs don't work for MSO. So the, the, uh, we thought quite hard about trying to generalize this to monadic second order, but it somehow uh, didn't work. Uh, and now, so... The standard length is one hour, right? Yes. Yeah, so okay. So then I think that it's best, uh, since I already did some proofs before, I will just skip uh, over uh, what I was gonna say about the proofs for these uh, statements. Uh, well, the paper is on my webpage anyway. Um, yeah, but yeah, so basically the point is that we we made use of, uh, um, well, a lot of stuff that was developed, uh, amongst others, by McDermott on these uh, minor clause graph classes. So there's a lot of deep stuff going on there involving generating functions and whatever. And we basically just uh, used a lot of those uh, results and added, uh, used some techniques from logic by McComb and Spencer and, and other people. Uh, but one thing that I would like to mention briefly is uh, the following, so, um, right, so we, one thing that um, not too many people that have worked on, in this area seem to have really looked at is uh, looking at the values of these limiting probabilities, right? So we have now settings wherein we know that the logical formulas, the probabilities of them converge, and we know that they don't converge just to zero one, but also to other values. So then you can ask yourself, so what, what is this set of limit points? What does it look like, right? Or what, what kind of numbers are there? So one thing, uh, some, some really cheap observations is, well, it's a countable set, right? Why? Because the number of formulas is countable, right? Because I have finite, uh, uh, what's a formula? It's a finite sequence of symbols and those symbols, they, you know, they're either brackets or certain logical symbols or there are variables, right? But the variables come from a countable set, if you like, right? You or you don't need, right? You just uh, x1, x2, etc. So it's only a countable number for formulas. So the set of limit points is countable. And also if I take, uh, instead of phi, I take not phi, then the probability will be one minus, right? So the probability that I'm not connected is one minus the probability that I'm connected. So the set is kind of symmetric, right? So if I mirror in, in one half, right? Or I take one minus X, it has this kind of symmetry. And so what I didn't uh, get into at all is uh, in our particular um, setting, in the proof, we, we had some kind of characterization of the limiting probability, namely that there's a, something called the, the Boltzmann-Poisson random graph, which is, uh, kind of a fixed random graph model um, where you feed in the radius of convergence of this, uh, the, this power series for the graph class that we're studying. And so we know that every of these limits will have to form, okay, our, our graph is in some, uh, some set of uh, possible graphs. So there's some fixed distribution of, on a random, of a random graph that has to fit in a certain set. And uh, that means that Every, uh, so the, these uh, things here, these are the, uh, this is the probability that this random graph here uh, is isomorphic to the graph H, right? So it's some random graph which has a probability distribution that is generated by this thing. And so we know that all the limit values take this form. It's uh, some sum of these, uh, these terms here over some family of graphs. Uh, however, um, you, yeah, in fact, you can, uh, there are uncountably many different numbers that you can write in this form, typically. So uh, this doesn't, uh, right? 
doesn't give much restriction. Uh, and you can, so you can wonder, so which, which possible numbers occur as limiting probabilities? Uh, so let me, well, let me skip through this because this is referring too much to the proofs that I skipped. But basically what we were able to show is that, so for any addable class of graphs, we don't know what this limit, uh, set of limiting probabilities look like, but we can at least show that um, uh, it's a finite union of inter, if we take the closure, it's a finite union, union of intervals, right? So we have zero, we have one, we have here this uh, thing, then we have countably many points that are limiting values, yeah? And so what we were able to show is that, in fact, uh, if you take the closure, then these limiting probabilities are somehow dense in a finite number of intervals, uh, always. And uh, uh, in fact, there's always here, around one half, there's always an interval that's empty. Right? So there's always a gap sort of in the middle, and uh, then there are, so at least two close, uh, two intervals here where you are dense inside. And in fact, um, what we're able to show is that, uh, so for forests, because this uh, generating function is so nice, we can actually work out exactly what the, not what the set of limiting probabilities is, but at least the closure, right? So the closure is exactly this explicit uh, set of uh, four intervals. <clears throat> and for planar graphs, we can also work out what it is explicitly However, it's a set of 108 different intervals, so I'm not writing it down, right? And you wouldn't be able to do much with it anyway, right? And these are expressed in terms of this um, um, radius of convergence of the, of the um, generating function. <coughs> okay. Um, oh yeah, so I'm gonna skip this proof. So the proof used the really nice old result um, by Kakea about uh, summing sequences of uh, numbers. Um, all right, and then, well, I'm almost out of time, or maybe I am out of time. Yeah, okay, well, I'm out of time. So another, yeah, another question is you can ask what happens for other class of graphs. So this was all for um, addable class of graphs, right? So you can ask what happens if I have a non-addable class of graph or maybe a, even um, a class of graph that's not minor closed, whatever, right? So there's a lot of uh, further work to be done and uh, we played around a little bit with other class of graphs. And so one natural question uh, that uh, I would like to mention, right? Or I maybe sort of mentioned already, so if we take these class of graphs on, uh, on a surface other than the plane, that's uh, I think a very nice uh, and natural class of graphs to play around with. Then you can ask, okay, does this MSO01 law, does that hold? Or the MSO convergence law, does this hold? Right, so remember that we could prove it for the first order. Can you prove it for, uh, for the MSO? And um, that would be related, that's related to a question uh, or conjecture by Shapri et al. on uh, coloring graphs on these surfaces. And what's a really exciting develop development, so since we wrote our paper, which is still, it's been accepted but still not published, uh, Mark Noyes and my co-author together with Albert Atzahias and maybe someone else have actually proved that um, that can't be true, right? So that uh, there, for surfaces other than uh, the plane, you can write um, I think they have an example of an MSO formula that doesn't even converge, right? So you have no convergence even for, uh, for, for, uh, for services. So it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, another, th another thing that would be natural to work on if anybody's interested is uh, try to find, of course, more information on these limiting probabilities that we, uh, we know exist. And in particular, uh, we conjecture that, so here we know that it's a finite number of intervals if the graph class is addable. And we are able to show that there's a gap here in the middle, so it's always at least two intervals. But in fact, we believe there will be two more gaps so that there will be at least four intervals. 
So that's a conjecture that's in our paper. And if anybody's interested, then uh, yeah, I would be uh, well. I would be very excited if you can solve that. And of course, uh, there are a lot of other types of questions in this area. So as you can ask, uh, so deciding or approximating, you know, if I give you a formula, uh, <clears throat> do you have some kind of algorithm for deciding what its limiting probability will be, right? Let's say for planar grass or for forest or something, right? So that could be uh, an interesting addition. And yeah, then of course, uh, there are lots and lots more uh, graph classes where we could do a similar kind of program and see what we get. All right, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, this is where I'll stop. Any questions or comments? And uh, did you think about the infinitary logic or you consider only finite sentences? Uh, we only considered finite sentences, yeah, so I haven't really thought about it. And why? So you didn't try or there are some problems with it? We didn't try, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I guess nobody on the team is really a logician, right? So we, yeah. I, I guess one of the reasons why, so Mark Norrie was really interested in this conjecture by Chapuis et al, right? So, because, uh, so color, like I said at the beginning, right, coloring can be expressed in terms of MSO, right? So. He wants to prove that at least um, if, the, if there's an MSO01 law, then you know that the probability that you're five colorable or the probability that you're four colorable, you know, it's either zero or one, right? Or if there's convergence law, it's some, some constant or something. So he wanted to basically attack questions about coloring, and that can be expressed in, in MSO. And there were some previous works by uh, McComb on uh, MSO for, for forest, I think, and some. I don't remember exactly, but there were some, yeah, so that's why we, we stuck to this choice. More questions? Okay, let us thank Tobias once again.